these look even tinier, but maybe that's just because they're sort of clear. Yeah, because of the transparency. So my name is Grant Jonathan. I'm from the Tuscarora Nation. Live and work in New York City full time for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I manage the tribal program down there, and in my spare time, I like to uh, do Tuscarora raised beadwork. It could be, it's definitely Tonawana Seneca style though, I can just tell by looking at it. Well, I like to look at the old pieces and I have quite the collection. I have almost 2,000 pieces of Tuscarora beadwork. So I like to look at a lot of old patterns, a lot of old techniques that were used in our work and get them revived and share them with some people. That's the thing with beadwork, sometimes multiple people made it, hmm. or it could be other bead workers in the family. But, you know, back then we didn't sign the pieces we created, so it's, it's difficult to attribute each piece to an individual beadworker. But this is beautiful. <laughs> beadwork is an incredible art form for a lot of Native American artists and communities. This one, Tuscarora, this is one of ours. It's probably 1870, 1880. The Tuscarora Nation is about six or seven miles away from Niagara Falls and all our families there used to sell beadwork at the falls you know it was it was to raise money um, we would sew all winter and during the summer and into the fall we would travel to Niagara Falls and and sell beadwork to tourists who came from around the world especially with the Erie Canal I mean once that was built um, access to Western New York from like the 1860s onward. Um, there was just an influx of people. So now you're finding these antique pieces of Tuscarora beadwork all over the world. I buy most of my collection online and I've had pieces come from Australia, from Europe, from Japan, just it's, it's everywhere. The Tuscaroras who have been doing it since the time of the Erie Canal have develop their own style. It's elegant and smaller um, and more distinct. Could they be old Tuscarora, meaning pre-Civil War? Possibly. But all our beadwork from 1860 on was clear glass in a size 8, 9, or 10 bead. Well, the Tuscaroras started out with crystal uh, beads. And some people think that maybe that was somehow influenced by all the foam and the mists that were coming out of Niagara Falls. Um, if you just want to come down for this one too, you can. It's a pretty simple dance. The ladies dance. <laughs> I grew up on Anadaga. Uh, my mother was uh, from Aquasesne. She's Turtle Clan. A long time ago, like they they make the pillows and things like that for souvenirs. They used red, yellow, blue, and green, and uh, clear. And that was a Mohawk trade. And if you look at their beadwork now. It's exploded into all the colors of the rainbow. But I started doing that and it's, it's, I love it because you can use shading, you can, you can make it all different colors you like. My favorite color is purple. One of the big characteristics of Mohawk beadwork uh, starting in the 1860s was in addition to the crystal beads, they used four colors. Blue, green, red, and yellow. There are leaves in all those colors. If there's one leaf that's red, there's a matching uh, leaf that's red. And two blues, two greens, and two uh, yellows. My English name is Wilma, Wilma Cook Zampano. My Mohawk name is Gawanalunyo. And what that means is she paints pictures in the sky with words. So I'll try and live up to my name today. <laughs> there was a bandolier bag 
that was collected 1850, 1870, and the dimensions were exactly this size. There were no beads on it. All the decorative work was done with quills, natural, and they some were dyed reddish color, I'm sure from strawberry or raspberry, and blue, probably blueberry or blackberry. And what um, uh, someone would carry in that would have been, number one is food, and it's kind of small, the pouch, you would think, but because corn expands with liquid, you wouldn't need a lot. So it would be his uh, food, his medicine, his uh, artillery, his weapons, and things like that. That's what would have been carried in this. Adornment for Haudenosaunee people has always been a really important part of lifestyle and daily dress. Um, so before Europeans, you have shell, you have copper, you have ceramic clay beads. Northern Iroquois groups, and there were manufacturers. There's a very uh, long uh, and deep history to Native American beadwork in the New York region. The earliest beads that we have on record currently are from two sites, one's in western New York and one is in the Connecticut Valley just east of New York. Uh, and these are sites of peoples that archaeologists call Paleo-Indians. They are the first Native Americans to inhabit New York. They migrated in during the late Ice Age, about 13,000 years ago. And the first of these is the Hiscock site in western New York in Genesee County exhibited by the Buffalo Museum of Science. And in addition to the Paleo-Indian spear points and stone tools that they found, they also recovered a single bead. This is a stone bead, it's made of sandstone. Uh, and you can see, if you could see this at a microscopic level, looking into the bore, you could see the rotary striations from the drilling process. If it is associated with the Paleo-Indian artifacts at the site, uh, we believe that this is the oldest beadwork in the New York region. This bead, if associated, dates to 13,000 to 12,500 years ago. By about 4,500 years ago, we start finding beads of bone. As we said, they first appear about 4,500 years ago, but because of acidic soils of the New York region don't preserve organic material well, it's an, it's entirely possible there's much earlier beadwork made on bones or perhaps other kinds of material. Around 4,000 years ago, marine shell coming from the Atlantic coast begins appearing on Native American sites in the New York region. What this tells us is that these people have connections with other Native American groups, both in and outside New York. After 1600, uh, bead working in the New York region shifts substantially because suddenly you have materials that are not, uh, some of which is native to New York, much of which is, which is not native to New York. So you have the fur trade uh, with the Dutch uh, trade kettles that look like this and usually had a handle on them like this. Uh, these are brought in and, and being uh, exchanged for furs with uh, Native Americans, including Iroquois and Algonquin groups. They're not using these typically as cooking vessels. They're using these as sources of raw material. They're cutting it into strips, and then they're rolling it into these tubular beads. So it's repurposing a trade good for their own purposes. Very smart idea. So he flew ahead of all of the rest, and he came down to the surface of the water. And there he found a great snapping turtle. So my name is Perry Ground. Said, I am a Turtle Clan member of the Onondaga Nation. From my waist up to my neck, I have on things that were introduced by Europeans. Uh, wool to make a sash, of course from sheep. Sheep are not indigenous to North America. They come uh, starting with the Europeans. Uh, cotton. Uh, cloth uh, to make our ribbon shirts that we uh, wear all across the United States now. Uh, each person again gets to choose the pattern or how they're ribboning for they want for each shirt. I have on some silver work that became traditional when Europeans came across the ocean also. 
Uh, and of course some beadwork that I have up on all parts of my regalia. A lot of people know Native Americans for beadwork and this is something that we started doing when the Europeans introduced these glass beads. Before that, shells and stones and quills, but now you could get beads of different colors, but they were also all the same size or shape, so they were much easier to sew together. Metal needles and string get introduced, and now you see people making all kinds of beautiful beadwork with symbols that come from who we are. Turtle from the creation story, or it's also a symbol for my family, my clan, that I have up here on my uh, gestoa, on my headdress. He visited the falls and Goat Island there and did not mention seeing anyone selling souvenirs. Uh, Haudenosaunee, or their ancestors, first got um, beads from uh, Europe, the glass beads. All the beads come from Europe, or they did back then in the early 1500s. And throughout the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, they um, probably wore them mostly as decorations. But starting in the 1800s, they started making uh, little purses and pin cushions. We had cottage industries in our community. There were many families that would, uh, well, many bead workers from different families that would come together. And sometimes you'd have five to 10 hands that would work on one piece. You would have one woman who would, she would bead the writing and then an, another woman would be uh, an animal, a bird or something. Another one would be leaves and the flowers. And then another woman would put it together. And when these items, these little souvenir pieces were sold at the falls, they would then split the proceeds and share. There may not have been a industry of Iroquois beadwork if it weren't for the Erie Canal. In 1822, um, there was a visit to Niagara Falls and there was no mention of anybody selling anything. The canal uh, started bringing people there in 1825 and by 1827 tens of thousands of people uh, were going to Niagara Falls and buying all sorts of beadwork and souvenirs from the Indians there. The technique that they developed is called raised beadwork. The beadwork is raised above the service of the fabric instead of laid down flat like other beadwork in North America. I do what's called Iroquois raised beadwork. Our work gives it a pop, um, the 3D effect. You see more color, you see more brilliance, you see more of everything than if it just lays flat. But a lot of these old techniques, they weren't lost, they just weren't used as much or prevalent in the community. But nowadays, they're teaching classes. So you have a lot of non-Tuscoras that are learning the skill of raised beadwork. And so I'm on the Seneca, there's a lot of raised bead workers. There's some at Onondaga, Oneida, Cayuga, even the Mohawks. So a lot of us take classes together or we just get together and bead and sew and we share different patterns and skills and techniques. And so the, the style of raised beadwork, it's getting out there. Folks try to dance in this and it's just, it's a lot. It's incredible. So, I mean, this is one of the most recent pieces of beadwork that we've added to the collection. But as you can see, it's, um, something that we can definitely grow in that area yes. for our collection. Haudenosaunee beadwork is really important in terms of gaining insight into contemporary issues uh, within Haudenosaunee communities. Um, and really, we can't talk about American history without talking about Native American history. And we can't talk about American art without talking about Native American art. And here in the East Coast, and particularly in what is now New York, there are incredible um, beadwork art forms going on, and still going on. And it's important to recognize that this has a legacy that continues today. They've been beading forever, but um, what relates to it is, this, is what we're doing here today, is selling our stuff to make ends meet. You know, we live off a lot of 
what I sell. Actually, I'm an accountant by day and I'm a bead worker by night. It's a nice balance, you know. Um, my accounting work is very stressful and this is my way to relax. It keeps me there. My husband's non-native, so and this is natives with beads, you know, and it just, it just keeps me connected. I believe that we need to keep this alive, this, you know, the, the art itself, to keep it alive because our people, um, this is what we are. This is a, 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 just a piece of our lives. I think anything historic, uh, that it's important to preserve it and capture it so that you know, the future generations can enjoy it and, and know their history.